Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. If you'll turn to James 1.19, uh, we're going to start there real quick. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, <clears throat> slow to wrath, for the wrath of God worketh not the righteousness of God. And I quoted that because for this study, even when I had to do the study, you know, I'm just I'm asking the brethren to be swift to hear, slow to speak, and you know, this whole thing, what we're going to be talking about is trespassing. People are saying um, Matthew 18. Okay? Uh, some of my studies in the past talking about 1 Corinthians 5. Uh, people bringing up uh, 1 Tim Timothy, I think it's, I always forget, they that sin uh, rebuke before all that others may fear. And it seems like even me sometimes, I'm not using them properly. And I'm thinking that I'm seeing that the body of Christ as a whole is getting confused and they're not following it properly. Okay? And the biggest important this message that I want you to get is the whole point of they that sin rebuke before all. The whole point of Matthew 18. Okay? So 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We're going to be talking about correction and reproof here. Okay. I'm a King James Bible believer, brothers and sisters of Christ, make sure you have your Bible out. There's a lot of verses to go through, so we're going to just talk about them. And I'm going to be telling you that to turn to them. I'm a very slow turner. I don't want this to be like a two-hour message. It was supposed to be something short. God showed me a lot, and I want to share it with you, brothers and sisters in Christ. So, let's talk, the main point of this is trespass. So let's look up the Webster's 1828 Dictionary for trespass, and then let's apply it to the Bible. See what the Bible says about trespass. Okay. Okay, trespass as it is, two definitions that I pulled out. First definition, to commit any offense or do any act that injures or annoys another. To violate any rule of rectitude to the injury of another. Okay. And it gives uh, 1 Kings 8.31 as an example. Trespass against a brother in Christ. Okay. Now this can also be a trespass against anybody lost and saved. But when we get to Matthew 18, it's talking about a brother in Christ. So that's the definition for trespassing against a brother in Christ. Okay. Uh, de another definition, in a moral sense, to transgress voluntary, voluntarily any divine law or command, to violate any known rule of duty. We have trespassed against our God, Ezra 10.10. 10. So you have a trespass that's again a against a man, a woman, when we get to 18, like I said, it's about, it's, folks, it's about trespassing against a brother in Christ, or it's a brother, but for instruction today, a brother and sister in Christ. And then you have a trespass where you can trespass against God. You've sinned against God. Okay. When it's used as a noun, there's two definitions. Any injury or offense done to another. Trespassing against man, uh, mankind, if you want to say. Um, and it uses, if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespass. Matthew 6.14 as an example. The other definition is any voluntary transgression of the moral law, any violation of a known rule of duty, sin. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, Ephesians 2, 1. So there we see it again. Trespass can be against mankind. You trespassing against another. And then there's trespass against God. So I'm going to go through some verses real quick so we can get the difference. Is it a trespass against man or is it a trespass against God? So Romans 16, 17. You want to turn to Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrines which ye have learned, and avoid them. Okay. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Now, does this fall under trespass against a brother in Christ? or against God. Okay. Well, if you turn to Philippians 3.19, notice in Romans 6.17 it says their own belly. Okay, They don't serve the Lord Jesus Christ, they serve their own belly. Philippians 3.19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, 
and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. This is them. This person is trespassed against God. He's not serving God. He's serving his flesh, a false god. Okay. But notice that it says, "Mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine. Mark them. You know, call them out." Okay, that person there, and it says, "Avoid them." That's what some of us in, in ministry do. We find someone out there that's doing this. We mark them and we tell you to avoid them. They've trespassed against God. It's not all. Because people will say that, well, you should have gone to that brother in Christ, Matthew 18. If it's not a brother in Christ, it's a false convert, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Matthew 18 doesn't apply. It only applies to someone who is saved. Okay. Titus 3.10. Let's turn to Titus 3.10. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. First and second. You give them two chances to repent when they're teaching something that's... Uh, false. Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of his self. Now, I looked up the word heretic. We always, you know, assume we know exactly what a word means, but I've asked people before and people have asked me and I've had to look it up. And I thought I knew what it meant, but when I looked it up, you know, part of this ministry is words have meaning. Heretic is used only once in scripture and that's in Titus 3.10. If I'm wrong, correct me in the comments. But I looked it up. I only saw it once in the New Testament. And I might have had the tab where it said New Testament only, but I could have sworn it said the whole Bible. I've only seen it used once. It's a person under any religion, but particularly the Christians, who hold and teach opinions repugnant to the established faith. We see that a lot today. There's people out there that turn from the Word of God and they're teaching things that are disgusting to us who know the Word of God and believe it and say, that's false. Okay. It's repugnant what they're teaching. Or that which is made the standard of orthodoxy, uh, traditions of men, and strictness among Christians, a person who holds and avows religious opinions contrary to the doctrines of Scripture. The only rule of faith and practice. Okay. In other words, a heretic is someone who doesn't go, that you say, that he could say, I'm a King James Bible believer. This is God's Word, and it's my foundation on matters of faith and practice. And then they go and start teaching traditions of men. It's about opinions. It's about feelings. And they pull people away from this book. What is that person? He's an heretic. If what he's teaching doesn't line up with this book, and you go to correct him, hey, uh, what you're teaching there doesn't line up with this book. And you can prove it comparing Scripture with Scripture. Not just grabbing one verse, but scripture with scripture. Okay. And major doctrines. Okay. Talking about major doctrines, the gospel, the Bible version issue. Okay. You give them two chances to repent and teach what's right. After that, you reject. Once again, this is a transgression against God. He's trespassed against God. He's perverting his word. Okay. So... You can look at this and say he's trespassing against God. He is. And I don't know, part of me wanted to make it a, well, he's leading people the wrong direction, but that's still trespassing against God. Okay. Um, how about a fault? Okay, here's where we get to the brethren. How about a fault? Okay. Galatians 6.1. Now that heretic... People can argue that with the falling away today, there's people that are falling away from major doctrine that they are truly saved, but they're given into the world and falling away. So there could be a saved or lost person. But for the most part, I don't think someone can truly fall away hardcore on the major doctrines. The biggest falling away I see is we're uh, given into the world, falling into the agree to disagree. I mean, I still believe in a pre-time of Jacob's trouble, but if you want to believe in post and mid-trib, that's okay, we can all come together. That's the falling away that I feel that's really going on with really truly saved brethren out there. Uh, I got saved off this gospel, but maybe it could be only belief, you know. What is that? They're falling away. Eternal security, yeah, you're sealed into the day of redemption, but maybe there's something where you can lose your salvation today. I don't believe you can lose your salvation. You know what I'm saying? That's called falling away. Now, don't get me wrong. With that one, people like to accuse us of being like that when we say in the time of Jacob's trouble, you can lose your salvation. Not today. 
in the church age, this dispensation, but in the future. And they say we're trying to apply it to today. So that's a whole other argument. But how about a fault? Galatians 6.1 Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the speak, in spirit of meekness. Consider thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Okay. James 5.16 says, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. A fault is something, a sin that you struggle with. A sin that you've trespassed against God. Does it mean you've actually sinned? Not necessarily. Okay. The first one there says you fell back into the fault. Galatians 6.1 If a man is overtaken in a fault, he falls into it. He sins. Okay. We're to correct him. He's trespassed against God. We're to pray for him. We're to do it in meekness. Um, can a fault turn into a trespass against a brother in Christ? Well, if you have anger issues, and that's a fault, uh, and get, you get angry without a cause, you're trespassing against God, but it can turn into a trespass against a brother in Christ. If you have a problem with lying, uh, stealing, all this stuff, you know what I'm saying? It can turn into a trespass against a brother in Christ, but the fault itself, without giving, get, falling into it, I, I always preach that my fault, video games, movies, TV shows, uh, sometimes I've gotten rid of the um, secular music that I used to listen to. Um, I have faults that I struggle with in my head and in my heart. God gets it out of my head and my heart's like struggling. You know, uh, you're supposed to be warring with the flesh now. There's a war that goes on. So we all have faults, but you haven't committed that sin yet. If you understand what I'm saying, that fault is something you, a sin that you struggle with. And when you fall into that fault, you've now committed the sin and you've trespassed against God. Now, how are we supposed to react and talk to do that? It says, um, Ye which are spiritual, saved, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Consider thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You restore one. You don't fall into the trap of falling into the same things. Like, if he's getting angry at you, don't fall into the trap of getting angry back. I failed this recently. Okay? Um, don't fall into that trap. Right? So there you can trespass against God again and it's potentially you can trespass against a brother in Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ephesians 4.31 Okay, the example, I forgot to do this, when I was talking about anger. Okay, the example, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. When you get angry, you can start turning, it can turn into bitterness. It can turn into wrath. It can turn into anger. Okay, Colossians 3.8, but now ye also, also puff up all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of the mouth. Some people can start cussing when they get mad. But someone gets angry at you, and trespasses against you, don't fall into the trap of, of returning it and getting angry with them. If someone lies about you, you don't turn around and lie about them. Okay? And so on and so forth. Right. Okay. Here's the next thing to talk about. Can a trespass be against God and a brother in Christ? We kind of talked about this, but let's actually look at this. So if you want to turn to Matthew 18.23. Matthew 18.23. Therefore, therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which take occasion of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But forasmuch as he had not to pay, his Lord commended him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. <clears throat> the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. I'll pay thee all. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. A hundred. And he laid hands on him, and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. 
and his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with my, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him in prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw that was, saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their lord all that was done. Then his lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that, that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldn't, thou, shouldn't not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And, this, and his word was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, for to you, if ye from your hearts, it's a heart thing, forgive not every one his brother their trespass. So we're going to get into a couple more here, but the point is, is I know this was kind of long, but I wanted to read this one. Your heart, repentance comes from the heart. When someone's truly sorry, it's going to come from the heart. Not just in word, but in deed. They're going to do their best not to do what they did that they had to say, I'm sorry for. Okay. But when somebody trespasses against you and you fail to forgive that person, they come to you truly repenting, it's coming from the heart, and you won't forgive them, you've now trespassed against God. Okay. Matthew 6.14 if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you trespasses. I know this is Old Testament, but the instruction of righteousness is there. You've trespassed against God when you refuse to forgive someone who repents that trespassed against you. Luke 17.30 Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. Notice it says, if he repent. Like I said, it's something that happens in the heart. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Okay. Real quick here, people will grab that. So basically, if I steal five dollars from you seven times in a day and come and repent seven times in a day, then you're to forgive me. Uh, I don't believe that's what this is talking about. It's talking about we make mistakes. We're going to make multiple mistakes in one day. I could trespass against a brother in seven different areas in one day. And if I'm truly sorry, heartfelt repentance, he's to forgive me. But if I'm stealing $5 out of his wallet seven times in one day, and every time I come back I say I'm sorry, am I truly sorry? No. No. Uh, if I'm sorry, I wouldn't keep doing it. Now some people will try to make excuses, but I'm just trying to use an example. When someone is truly repenting, there's supposed to be fruits of that repentance. Okay. So I wanted to throw that in there. Um, but a trespass by a brother in Christ becomes a trespass against God when you do not forgive give the brother that did the trespassing. He comes to you and repents and asks you to forgive him. You forgive him. If you hold that in you, like become bitterness, and hold a grudge and everything, you're now trespassing against God. Okay. So now let's get to Matthew 18. What's the whole point of Matthew 18? What are the steps in Matthew 18? And remember, this is Old Testament, but it's good for instruction and righteousness. We'll talk about the part that I have a problem with when they try to apply the whole thing to today. Okay. Now, let's see, Matthew 18:5. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So what's the first step? You go to him one on one alone. Okay. Now this is not a trespass against God yet. Remember we just talked about it. And If you gain your brother, he repents, you forgive him. You fail to forgive him. Then he trespasses against God. This is a trespass against a brother in Christ, the brethren, okay? a brother or sister in Christ. Not a lost person, not a wolf in sheep's clothing, not God, yet the brother has trespassed against you and you go to him. Okay? Now, one thing I always try to say, it's a personal trespass that is done by a brother to a brother. 
It's something that he did to me. Now, there's sometimes a person can trespass against the brethren as a whole, but this is talking about going to that one person, that one brother singular. It's one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. Now, notice that this whole process, the whole process of Matthew 18, sometimes I forget about it. I know a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ out there forgetting about it. And this is where I'm getting a little bit strict. So I'm starting here, rebuking myself, and I'm rebuking the brothers and sisters in Christ out there that are forgetting. The whole point of Matthew 18 is to gain thy brother. When a brother trespasses, let's say I trespass against you, I put up a wall, the fellowship is not there anymore. There's a wall. You want that fellowship back, so you go to me saying, hey, you've wronged me, you've trespassed against me. Trying to, trying to get me to take down the wall so you can gain your brother back and continue with the fellowship. Okay? It's gaining your brother is the whole point of Matthew 18. And some people forget that. They think it's a, it's a game about I'm right, he's wrong. It's a game of I'm, I'm, I'm all-powerful or I'm up here and you're down there. You know? It's not about that. Mm -hmm. Gained means reached, reaching your brother. Okay. So, and in this situation, because we're going to talk about it, in this situation of Matthew 18, if I've trespassed against you, I'm the one that broke fellowship. I hear this so much with uh, the brethren out there. Uh, we broke fellowship. We broke fellowship. No, I trespassed against you. I broke the fellowship. I put the wall up. There's no we that has anything to do with it. Okay. i got to throw that in there because we'll be talking about some things. Now, another thing that's going on, the people are skipping this step. Okay, It is a command to go to your brother one-on-one. -on -one. So, now if you fail to go to your brother that trespassed against you one-on-one, -on -one, this is where it ends. There is no step two. There is no step three. You don't keep going down Matthew 18. It ends. If you will refuse to go to that brother that trespassed against you one-on-one, -on -one, the rest of this doesn't apply to you. It doesn't apply to you at all. How many of us have been guilty of that, of skipping that step? Trying to say, hey, brother, let's go talk to him. Hey, can you come with me and go talk? How many of us are guilty of, of skipping that step? The rest of the verses don't apply to us then. Right. That's important to understand. Now, if the brother that trespassed against you refuses to talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, you're trying to go to the person that trespassed against you, he refuses to talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, then you're free of it. Then you can move on to step two. All right. But if thy brother repent, then you have gained thy brother. That's the whole point of Matthew 18, brothers and sisters in Christ, to gain your brother, to get that fellowship going again. Okay. Matthew 18, 6. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. People are having a hard time with this one, brothers and sisters of Christ. Why? Um, there's two things I see happening. One, they're not bringing two or three, two, uh, one or more witnesses. You're, I'm a witness. So if somebody's trespassed against me, I'm a witness. I have to have one or two other people that have seen it. Okay, let's get into this. Um, witness, a person who knows or sees anything, one personally present as he was witness, he was an eyewitness to give evidence. Okay, they're messing up Matthew 18. You don't just grab bro any brother, just any brother in Christ will do. You don't just grab, brother Christ. instead of doing one or two, let's grab five or six or seven. Is that what this is saying? No. It has to be witnesses. Why can't just the one person be the witness? Well, if you turn to Deuteronomy, let's talk about the Bible, what it says about one witness. Deuteronomy 19.15. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin and any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two 
witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. It has to be established. It can't be established with one witness. You can't say, well, I'm the witness, just trust me. Just trust me. Brothers, I need your help going after this guy, and just trust me, he trespassed against me. It has to be a witness. And John 5.30, and this is the best example that I can come up with, Jesus Christ. I can of mine own self do nothing, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Why? What did it say in Deuteronomy about one witness? It can't be established. There is another that bear witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witness of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. There's one. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. Okay. So you have John as a witness. The works that God the Father was doing through Jesus Christ was a witness. And Jesus himself is a witness. But by himself, it can't be established. Three witnesses. Okay. You can't have one witness. Now, what happens when you have only one witness? And I know a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ can attest to this. Okay. 1 Timothy 6.3 If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, 1 Timothy 6.3, wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and do the doctrines which is according to godliness, he is proud knowing nothing but doting about questions and strife of words, whereof cometh envying, strife, railings, evil, evil surmisings. Okay. Evil surmisings is the act of suspecting. You suspect somebody, it's evil surmisings, but you have no evidence. Okay. Now, why did I choose this verse? Okay, first, the Word of God is, is our witness. What if we didn't have the King James Bible? If we didn't have a final authority, a foundation to say, Thus saith the Lord, what would happen? It would become he said, she said. It would be based off feelings and opinions. Well, I think this. Or, well, I think this. Or I feel this. And my opinion is this. Well, I say it should be this. What happens when you only have one person that's a witness, but you don't have it established? This is established right here. What happens when you don't have it established? You don't have two or three witnesses. You just have yourself. Okay? Next thing you know, they're going to be doting about questions and strife of words. Okay? There's going to be strife. There's going to be tension. It's just going to be he said, she said. Okay? Now, there are times where you're going to be the only witness. And I want to point this out. You can follow step one in Matthew 18 if you're the only witness. You can still go to your brother that trespassed against you and try to gain him. Hey, you trespassed against me. I don't want this to get in, our, in the way of our fellowship. You've wronged me. All right? You can still try to go to him and get him to repent so you can gain your brother. But that's where it ends if you're the only witness. It doesn't move on to step two, where you're supposed to take two or three witnesses. You don't have one or two other witnesses. Now, you can pray for a witness. Okay? Say, God, I've tried to gain my brother, and I'm the only witness, Lord. Help me to have other witnesses so I can go gain my brother. Not so I can go to my brother and say, ha-ha, I've got other people who caught you. Oh, ha-ha-ha. No, it's because I want to gain my brother. I want that fellowship back. Okay? That's the whole point. This whole point of Matthew 18, brothers in Christ, never, ever, ever forget it's about gaining your brother. That's the whole point of Matthew 18, is to gain your brother. Get that fellowship back. All right. Get that fellowship back and not holding something in your heart that's going to affect your fellowship with other people. It's that fellowship. All right. Matthew 8, 17. 
So the first step is you go to them one on one. Second step, you bring one or two witnesses that before the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything may be established. It's a fact this person has wronged them. And you got to be careful. We'll talk about that in a little bit ahead about witnesses. Just because I say I have two witnesses, one or two witnesses, doesn't mean you're automatically guilty. We'll talk about this. Okay. Um, the third step, uh, Matthew 18, 17, And if he shall neglect to hear them, who's the them? The witnesses. Tell it unto the church, but if you neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. We'll get to that part. That's the part I'm like, where at in the New Testament does it say where to do that? Because we'll get to that. But first, the neglect to hear them, the witnesses, neglect to hear the church. People say, well, that's the whole body of Christ. We're going to get into that. It's not the whole body of Christ. I don't believe that's the context of church here. Because this is Old Testament. Church is a called out assembly. Okay? A group of people. A select group of people. Today, the church is the body of Christ. We're separate from the world. We're called out. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Okay? But the point is, it's still about gaining your brother. Even at this point, it's about gaining your brother. Even when you're telling it to the church. Okay? Um, what's the church referring to here? Uh, one of the definitions of church is the body of clergy or ecclesiastics in distinction from the laity, hence the ecclesiastic authority. In other words, a set of people that are set aside that they're the authority in religious matters. Okay. An assembly of sacred rulers convened in Christ's name to execute his laws. Hmm. Uh, basically, a church is a called out assembly, but for instruction righteous today, I'd have to say that if we're going to use this for instruction righteous today, when it says, um, tell it unto the church, I'd say it's the elders, the deacons. It's the church is the whole, all the safe sinners in the whole world. You're going to email and write letters and phone every safe sinner in the world? No. You're going to take it to the elders in that area, like, the, like they would back in uh, Paul's day. Today we're so spread thin. So online, we have bread, uh, elders online that we can get a group of elders together and say, Hey, I've tried to reach them one-on-one. -on -one. I don't want to lose this brother in Christ. He's wronged me. I've went with two, uh, one or two witnesses. That before two or three witnesses, everything may be established. He won't listen to them. I'm going to you, brothers in Christ, deacons, elders, so you can talk to him. And I have one last chance to try to gain my brother and get him back. And they will talk to him. Uh -huh. Now, the thing I have to point out about the deacons, as some people don't realize, is... I, let's say you get a 60-year-old person that gets saved, and he's an elder, right? He's an elder. I mean, he's 60 years old. He's an elder in age, but he's not an elder in spirit in the church, okay? He's newly saved. That's not an elder. You can have somebody that got saved at 16, and they're like 20, you know, three years, that they're not necessarily considered, could be considered an elder or a deacon to a hardcore point, but they can be a witness. They've experienced some things. There, you can have somebody who's saved at 25, and they've been saved since they were 16. Now you have seven years. Could they be considered an elder in the church? They've gone through some experiences. They've gone through studies. They've done work for the Lord. Yeah. But the whole point is it's not about the age of the person. It's their walk with the Lord. How long have they been saved? Have they gone through some experiences? Do they stand for what is truth, absolute truth? Okay. 2 Timothy 2.15, do they do that? Right. There's guidelines that you can read about a deacon, okay? What a deacon's supposed to be. What, what he has to meet to be considered a deacon. Mm -hmm. So, once again, hear them. You're still trying to gain your brother. That's the whole point of this. Matthew 18 is so you can gain your brother back. It's not to hold him down. It's not to put him down. It's not so I can look good and he can look bad. It's to gain your brother. Right. Now, step four here. I had to put a question mark here. Like I said, this is Old Testament. Jesus hadn't died.
was looking at something real quick. This is Old Testament, but it says that if they neglect to hear the church, the elders talk to that person and say, hey, the witnesses are true. They're not false. You did wrong this brother in Christ. You need to repent. And he refuses to listen to him. It says, let them be as a heathen man and a publican. You know what a heathen man is? A pagan, a Gentile, one who worships idols, or is unacquainted with the true God and the scriptures. The word seems to comprehend all nations except the Jews. So today, when we have a brother in Christ that we're trying to gain, so we don't lose that fellowship permanently or for a long time, because there's always a chance he can come back, or she, we're to treat them as if they're lost, they're hell-bound sinners. Okay. Back then, you were to treat them as if they were an outsider. They're not a Jew. They're treated as an outsider, a Gentile, a heathen. Okay. Now, publican, that I can understand a little bit. Publican, a collector of toll or tribute. Among the Romans, a publican was a farmer of the taxes and public revenue, and the inferior office, office and the inferior officers of this class were deemed oppressive. What's oppressive mean? Unreasonable, burdensome, unjustly severe. Okay, but unreasonable. I can see that. Okay, you cast. Uh, he broke the fellowship. You didn't break it. He broke it. He's being unreasonable. You've gone to him by yourself, showing charity. You've gone to him with two, one or two witnesses that are supposed to show charity. Okay, that goes for everybody. And then you've had the church, the elders in the church, talk to him. At this point, he's being unreasonable. I get that. But the heathen part? Another definition for heathen, it says, a rude, illiterate, barbarous, person. Barbarous means cruel, ferocious, inhuman. You're to treat him as if he's rude, illiterate, uh, like he doesn't understand the scriptures. Okay. But you got to be careful when it says heathen that you're, you, you're not falling into the trap of, okay, it says heathen, I have to treat him like he's a lost, hell-bound sinner. See, he wronged me, therefore he's a lost, hell-bound sinner. Be careful with that. I can understand it, that he's illiterate in the sense that he's not understanding the scriptures and he's not following the scriptures. Okay? Uh, that he's being like a publican, oppressive. He's being unreasonable. And that's how you treat him. You treat him as someone who's being unreasonable. You treat him as someone who doesn't know the word of God. He's illiterate. Okay? So like I said, you've got to be careful with this. Instruction of righteousness is there. But the whole point, okay, the whole point of Matthew 18, and I'll say it one last time, brothers and sisters in Christ, the whole point of Matthew 18 is to gain your brother back. That's what it's about. Getting that fellowship back from your brother that wronged you. You say, well, he should do it. The Bible does say that before you give your alms, it's the part of the Bible that talks about you leave your... Um, gift at the altar and go make amends with your brother before you do that I understand that but this has to do with you wanting that fellowship you going to him saying I want to gain my brother okay. that's what Matthew 18 is all about there's just no way to get around it and I believe today I've fallen in the trap in the past that it's more about I'm right he's wrong it's about me have an authority over this man or something, getting puffed up with knowledge. You know, we got all this knowledge and we're puffed up. Look at us. When it applies to Matthew 18, and it's a brother in Christ, not a false convert, not a wolf in sheep's clothing, not a lost person, we're not to fellowship with the lost world. It's about gaining your brother. And you have to be humble, and you've got to drop the bitterness, the anger, the hate, the pride, if you want to gain your brother. You can't go after him hardcore with anger, bitterness, pride. I had to throw those in there. So, Matthew 18, what we're going to get to next, is about a brother in Christ that's trespassed against you and they broke fellowship. They did something to put a wall between the two of you guys so you no longer have fellowship or good fellowship. 
Okay. Now, the New Testament, there's only one justification for you. Okay, you're in the right. The brother in Christ is in the wrong. They trespassed against you. They broke fellowship. You didn't. Now, you're still in the right in this situation. Is there justification for you to do the breaking of the fellowship? He broke it when he was in the wrong, but is there justification for you? We've talked about this. Let's just go over it real quick. 1 Corinthians 5.11 But now I have written unto you not to keep company with any man that is called a brother, be a fornicator or covetous or idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, which such a one know not eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do, ye, do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourself that wicked person. Why I bring this back up again? This is the only thing I can find in Scripture in the New Testament where it's saying if a man be called a brother, you absolutely know, you know, he's a brother. So you've got to treat him like a brother. You correct him. You warn him. Hey, what you're doing is wrong. You've trespassed against God. We'll get to it where you rebuke him before all that others may fear. This is the only justification I've seen in here where you can break fellowship with him, that you are justified in breaking fellowship. Matthew 18 is somebody else breaking fellowship with you. This, pardon me, this is you breaking fellowship with him. And I try to, in my head sometimes, to try to do a great example is, if I had trespassed against a brother in Christ, and I stand up here and go, well, we broke ties, uh, we broke fellowship, we broke fellowship. No, I did. Now, I'm in one of these sins in 1 Corinthians 15, and I'm still trying to save face with people, and they come to me, well, why don't you and brother so-and-so that's in ministry, why don't you guys talk and it's like that? Well, we broke fellowship. That's a lie. I'm the one that broke it because I didn't heed the warning of the brethren when it came to these things. Right. Now, you need to make sure that brethren falls under these things. Right. But that's the only justification I can see for you breaking fellowship with them. We saw in Matthew 18 that others can break, other brothers in Christ can break, the brethren can break fellowship with you, and it's not your fault. You didn't do the breaking. There is no we broke fellowship. Right. Now, trespassing against God, I wanted to quote three more verses. You don't have to turn to them. Because I just wanted to explain that trespasses, these are three times in the New Testament we were talking about trespassing. Okay. 2 Corinthians 5.19 To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespass unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. It's talking about salvation. Okay. And notice there it also says that God was in Christ. If you can't see, I'm rolling my eyes because these Trinity people can't seem to get it. But tre uh, trespass, it's talking about salvation. Ephesians 2.1 And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Trespassing against God again, talking about salvation. You were, in, uh, you were dead in trespasses and sin. Can you still trespass against God today? Yes. But you're not under the law of sin and death. Dead in trespasses and sin. You're under the law of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Colossians 2.13 And ye, being dead in your sins and in your uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Once again, you get saved, God forgives you of your trespasses of your lost life. Now, when it comes to the law of sin and death, your sins are still forgiven. You go to God and say, please forgive me, but we can't forget about the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Uh, Matthew 18, we already talked about this. Uh, the whole point of Matthew 18 is to gain your brother. But also when I said you have to have charity, 1 Corinthians 8.1, 8, when I was talking about uh, now is touching things offered unto idols, we know that all that we all have knowledge, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. You can't edify the church. You can't edify a brother in Christ if you don't have charity. You can't rend your brother back if you're not going to him with charity. First mm -hmm. Corinthians thirteen two. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. 
Charity is very important. It's a key, if you want to say a key ingredient to Matthew 18. You need to have charity. Now, here, here we're going to talk about the trespassing against God. So we've, conf we've compared Matthew 18 with 1 Corinthians 5. What's the difference? 1 Corinthians 5, you're breaking the fellowship off. You're putting away that wicked person. Uh, Matthew 18, the person that trespassed against you, that refuses to repent, you've tried to gain your brother, they're the ones that cut off the fellowship. They broke the fellowship. Okay. Now we're going to compare 18, Matthew 18 to 1 Timothy 5.20. Okay. What's the difference here? Matthew 18, what's the purpose of it? You're trying to gain your brother. What's the purpose of 1 Timothy chapter 20? Or 5 chapter 5 verse 20. We're going to start in 19 because we're going to talk about verse 19. Against an elder receive not an accusation but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin, here's verse 20, them that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that thou observe these things without preferring one before another, doing nothing by partiality. We're not supposed to be respecter of persons. Now, there it talks again about the two or three witnesses in verse 19 about the elders. I'm making sure I'm not losing my place. Okay. Uh, talk about witnesses that do not line up with accusation against Jesus. This is what we're going to talk about. They're supposed to have witnesses. But just because I say I have two witnesses, does that mean I'm automatically right? Well, if you turn to Matthew 26, 58, uh, they had a lot of witnesses against a certain guy in the, in the Old Testament. Okay. Let's talk about that guy. 26, 58, But Peter, following him afar off unto the high priest's palace, and went in, and sat with the servant to see the end, now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought fault witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses. Okay, you can have false witnesses. When you try to say, I have two witnesses, you can have two false witnesses. Right there we read, against an elder received not an accusation. Not a rebuke, okay, um, like the, where it says, Then that sin rebuke before all the others may fear. It's called an accusation. You're accusing him of something, but before two or three witnesses. But you can still bring two or three witnesses and then go, okay, their stories don't line up. Okay? They're, not, they're not good witnesses. They're false witnesses. Okay, bring us witnesses that are true. Their stories line up. Okay? Now, does 1 Timothy 5.20 only apply to the elders? Because people will say that. Well, it's just 19 because the previous verse is talking about elders. That says accusation. You're just accusing him of something. He still has to be found guilty of it. All right. Now, verse 5 of 1 Timothy 5. Now, she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplication and prayer night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth sin. Uh, verse 8 talks about, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Then that sin rebuke before all. This man has a wife and children, and he's sitting at home watching movies and not working. He's playing pool, he's gambling, he's doing this, and he's not providing for his own. That falls under them that sin rebuke before all. It's not just talking about the elders, brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay. And one of the things I have to say is, is do we let sin infest the body of Christ? Okay. Uh, first, especially 1 Corinthians 5. Remember, that's your justification to break fellowship off. Put away that wicked person before you. Does they that sin rebuke for all apply to those in 1 Corinthians chapter 5? Yes. It does. But they're not all elders. It still applies. Um, 
What about a woman that sins? An elder is a deacon. Okay. It's a man. So when women sin, they don't have to be called out. Then the sin rebuke before all. It says them. Okay. It doesn't say men only. Just stuff I'm throwing out there for you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay. Now, understand, if I did videos calling people's sins out, starting with me, all my videos would be about me. I'm just going to be straightforward. All those, I would never be able to even get to anybody else. But what's the difference? It's called when you rebuke someone, it's because they haven't repented. If somebody repents... You don't have to rebuke them before all. There's times where you can still you still do, but you don't have to. I'm just throwing that in there, brother and sister Christ. The reason we're not doing videos rebuking everybody of their sin all the time is because you don't have to. If they repent and they're truly sorry and it comes from the heart, you don't have to do it. But there are times we're going to get to this where you still, even if someone repents, you still rebuke before all. Why? Because now we're going to get to it. What's the point, the number one point of First Timothy 5.20. They that sin rebuke before all. Okay? Matthew 18, the trespass. They, the, someone's trespassed against you. But what's the point of Matthew 18? So you can gain your brother. What's the point of Matthew, or First Timothy 5.20? That others may fear. That others can learn from your mistake. They can learn from this mistake of others. They can learn about the consequences that others may fear. Okay. A good example of 1 Timothy 5.20, if you want to turn to Galatians 2.9. Okay. Galatians chapter 2.9, here we have Peter and we have Paul. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barmas the right hand of fellowship that we should should go unto the heathen, and they unto the, uncir uncir they unto the circumcision. See, we see the word heathen again. Someone who's not Jewish. Okay. Only they would, that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was for, for, forward to do. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews disassembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly, this is Paul, he saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. What's going on in Galatians? Uh, the Jews are coming in trying to say, well, they still need to keep some of the laws to be saved. It's not just the, the gospel, you know, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. No, they got to keep the law to be saved too. Okay? And when Peter saw it, he's the witness. He went to him one on one. No, he brought two, one or two witnesses. No, what did he do? I said unto Peter before them all, he said over there, I withstood him to the face. If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compelst thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? He called him out right then and there. He saw what was going on first and then he called him out. Where's Matthew 18 in that? Uh -huh. They were sinning against God. They were sinning against the gospel. They were trespassing against God. They that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. There's a difference between Matthew 18 and 1 uh, Timothy 5.20. Okay. Now, how do we know that Paul is four witnesses? Okay. 2 Corinthians 13.1 This is the third time I'm coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. When Paul is correcting Corinthians, the Corinthians, it's because there's two or three witnesses. Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 5.1, it is reported commonly. We're going back to Matthew chapter 5, but we're only hitting it for this point. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. It's reported. There's witnesses. 
Paul's not against witnesses. Okay? But when it comes to trespassing against God, this is your witness right here. Paul had the Holy Spirit in him. He had the true gospel in him. They were going against it. Okay. Now, now when it comes to trespassing against God, you correct your brother on the spot. Okay. Uh, there's times that you correct him on the spot. Absolutely. There's times where if you feel the need, you can wait and correct him, pull him to the side and correct him. Okay. But there's times where you're going to have to correct him on the spot. That's serious. If you're sitting there doing a Bible study and someone brings up something where um, they're going against the gospel, uh, you correct them on the spot. You don't go, oh, I, I better wait until, you know, nobody's around and then I'll, I'll, I'll correct them. You know, you're kind of wrong. You're kind of fall into, you know, that you can lose your salvation or that you're taking repentance out. No, you correct them on the spot. If he refuses to repent, you rebuke him before all. Uh -huh. You tell him what he's doing wrong to, to, his, to his face, and other people can be around. If he repents, you, get, you know, that's great. If he refuses to repent, you rebuke him before all. Let's see. Brother Tim, Brother Brian, uh, King James Video Ministries, Tim at over at AVBT. Brother JT and I have been accused of not following Matthew 18 when rebuking people of their trespass against God. Okay. Mainly lost people. Okay. False teachings, false doctrines. You guys, brothers and sisters of Christ, you need to understand the difference where in Matthew 18 does it say rebuke before all. Show me in Matthew 18 where it says rebuke before all. They that sin rebuke before all. Matthew 18, you're to go tell it to the church, the elders, the deacons. If you won't listen to them, then he's, and then, like I said, we already talked about the heathen and publican part. He's someone who's unreasonable and is illiterate and doesn't, understand, doesn't seem to comprehend the word of God in the situation where he trespassed against you. Okay. Where does it say rebuke before all in Matthew 18? It's not there. Okay. Now, do you ever rebuke before all that others may fear when someone repents? Like I said, when somebody actually repents, true godly sorrow, uh, and they repent, do you still rebuke them before all, or do you sweep it under the rug? How many of you know where I'm going with this? These Babel buildings, let's just uh, sweep it under the rug. Mm -hmm. Now, I was told a story by a brother in Christ 40 years ago. Uh, you have Texas, you have Oklahoma, there was these huge Babel buildings. You had these big showings. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that these people were saved. I'm not saying, and I can't say I, they're not. It's, way, it's 40 years ago. Um, but there was a pastor, a professing pastor, if you want to say, who was an ex-lineman for the Dallas Cowboys team. Okay? And he knew what went on in those, in the Dallas Cowboys and the, the sports and everything. They would not build, they didn't build their own place, they rented places to do sermons. They were huge halls at universities that held, you know, anywhere between a, it had to be between 100 and 300 people. Okay? A lot of people. Now, one service, they had a man and his wife standing up there by the pastor in the center up front. Mm -hmm. uh, the man, the pastor, try, you know, he calms people down. This guy's got to talk. And if you've ever been to Babel buildings before, you realize that even though they say calm down, there's still some noise going on a little bit here and there, you know, someone talking or something. But he's quieting them down. This brother in Christ has something he's got to tell the church. So he hands the mic to the brother in Christ. And the, mic, the brother in Christ holds the mic and just tells and says, I've cheated on my wife. I have committed adultery against my wife. Everything got dead silent. You could hear a pin drop. All eyes were on him. I have committed adultery. I have fornicated outside of marriage, cheated on my wife. Now, his wife was willing to stay with him, but they talked about, you could lose your wife. He lost his standing, how people looked at him at the church. Uh -huh. He was repenting. He was sincere. 
but that others may fear? It's a serious thing, brothers and sisters Christ. The pastor said that that man would commit adultery would be under his headship of the elders in the matter and for guidance to hold him accountable to that, to that repentance. Hold him accountable to the Word of God. Right. Now, this wasn't the worst part, brothers and sisters in Christ. You say, well, between, let's say it was maxed out, 300 people. He had to do that before. 300 people. That wasn't the worst part. That was just the first service. There was two more that he had to stand up before. Okay. They that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. People in that auditorium, look what happened to him. Look what he has to go through. I don't want to go through that. I don't want to have to stand up here before the body of Christ and see me like that. I don't want to lose my wife. I don't want to lose my kids. I don't want to lose fellowship with her. I don't want my walk with the Lord to be damaged like that. They that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. Now, I did a video rebuking a certain man so that others may fear. He compromised. Okay. He went through a lot of pain and suffering. You know who, what man I'm talking about? If you follow this ministry, you know what man I'm talking about. I did a public rebuke of me. And if you want to listen to it, it's um, Apologies to the Brethren. Okay. Why did I do that? So I can put myself down? So I can just purposely feel miserable and everything? No. That others may fear. That from my mistake and what I went through, my compromise and my sin, that you guys won't make the same mistake and won't go through the same thing. That is what 1 Corinthians 5.20 is all about. You can do it to people who refuse to repent. You can do it to the lost world. You can also do it to people who do repent. That others may fear. Okay. They're not the same when it comes to Matthew 18. Mm -hmm. So I've hoped this helped open your eyes, brothers and sisters in Christ, and encouraged you to follow Matthew 18. Encouraged you to realize that the whole point of Matthew 18 is fellowship with that brother that wronged you. To get back to that fellowship, to gain your brother back, and how that is very, very important. And if you're someone who's wronged somebody, drop the pride. Uh, repent. So you can get that fellowship back. All right. um, so to overview, Matthew 18 and 1 Timothy 5.20. Okay, they're not the same situation. One, you're only telling the, the witnesses. You go one-on-one, -on -one, witnesses, and then you tell the church, and the church tells him. Okay, Matthew, uh, 1 Timothy 5.20, you're rebuking for all that others may fear and learn from it. Matthew 18 and 1 Corinthians 5, two things to take away from this when it comes to breaking fellowship. Some people feel bad because it's like, this brother in Christ wronged me, and now the fellowship's broken. Is it my fault? No. Fellowship, the fellowship didn't fall apart because of you when, Matt, when it comes to Matthew 18. Fellowship falls apart, uh, not falls apart, the fellowship is broken because for you, for math, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, it's still their fault in 1 Corinthians 5, but you're the one that's breaking the fellowship. Make sure you're taking these two things, brothers and sisters in Christ. Our fellowship today is very important. I said this recently, doors have not fully closed to fellowship. Okay? Make sure that you're using Matthew 18 properly and correctly. Okay? You go to them one-on-one. -on -one. It's a command. You refuse to, the rest doesn't matter. If they refuse to, to meet with you and talk with you, you've done your part. Two, you're to go with two to three witnesses. You fail to go with two to three witnesses, the rest doesn't apply. If you don't have two or three witnesses, then you can only do step one. And step three is talking to the church and having the church talk to that brother in Christ as a whole, the elders, the deacons in that area. But for today, we're spread thin. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. 
I really do. I love fellowship. I don't want things to, to really get in the way of our fellowship. But understand, this is our final authority. Okay? This is. And we need to follow it correctly. Right? So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. See you in the next video.